Because when people go to church, they just want to sit down and then talk to their friends and, and just want to hear the sermon and get blessed and go home. That many people might not have the heart to say, are all the people in the church saved? Do they need help? Do they have problems? You might say, well, they have been here for a long time. They should be okay. But let me tell you, that's not true. Many Christians have been in church for a long time. They might be lazy Christians. They might be burdened Christians. They have a lot of problems. Actually, if you talk to more people, you find that many people have problems. And, and how can you grow? If you start to talk to people, you don't have to first talk about what problems they have. You just care about them. Hi, my name is so and so. What is your name? How are you? How long have you been to church? I'd just like to know you. And also, you know, uh, the church can arrange a uh, uh, situation. Uh, Pastor, you can arrange situation that they can have the chance to know each other and talk to each other, know each other's name, and then uh, be uh, caring for each other. That way, the people are trained to care for people, are trained to talk to each other. And when you talk to each other, you build up the courage. You build up the courage and say that, yes, I can <coughs> talk to people. And when you talk to people, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. So many people said, oh, I have a problem praying. I have a problem overcoming my feelings, my emotions. I have a problem relating to people. I have a problem with my family. So many people would have this problem. You can ask them, you know, uh, is there anything I can pray for you? Uh, and when you start to care for people, you will see, you will start to build up compassion. That's what I, you know, that God built up in my heart. Because when I talked to so many people, I found so many people need help. And then I listened to them and, uh, and then we try not to teach. If you just teach, then they don't like you to talk to them. But you empathize. You say, yes, I know it is difficult. Say it with me. Yes, I know it is difficult. Yes, I, know it is difficult. I know it's not easy. I know you're facing difficulties. I know it's hard to handle those problems. I know it's hard to relate to some people like that. That is feeling their feelings. Say it. Feeling their feelings. As if you were them. As if you were them. That you feel their feelings. When you feel people's feelings, you see, and then people would like to talk to you. They feel that you hear them, that you know their needs, and then you find that you have a lot of people to help. It's true. So you can try to come to church early and try to know the people, listen to them. How were you last week? And can I pray for you? Anything I can pray for you? And then you can also have it happen. If they don't have any problems or any needs, you can pray together for the church or pray for each other's needs. When you start to do that, and then your life will start to go up. And you get used to helping people. And the whole church atmosphere will change. In all the groups I lead, I have led, all the, the churches I led, I always encourage people to talk to each other care for each other and have small groups that they can talk to each other and help each other. That it, I make it part of the sermon. For instance, when I preach, I don't just teach, preach. For instance, if I preach about handling problems, I will have people sit in twos. And then they will uh, share with each other, uh, handle problems, how each one of us handle problems, what do you find difficult, and what do you find helpful. And then they share with each other. And then the other person will try to listen and <coughs> empathize with them. And then maybe guide them to find a solution. This is counseling. Not just to tell. Now some people just tell. You should do this. You should not do that. How do you feel when someone tells you that? You should do this. You should not do that. You should not be affected by them. You should pray more. You should care about them. You should forgive them. How do you feel? Do you feel good or not good? Not good. Not good. Because you feel he's a teacher. He's teaching down at you. Now there are people who come to me these last few days. And you will notice, I was guiding you. Actually, you know, I would first 
he, listen to you. This is the skill of counseling. Listen and empathize and say, yes, I know it is difficult. I know this is not easy. I know it's hard to handle the problem. So I would talk like that. And then I would say, how did you try to handle the problem? Did you try to, how did you try to handle the problem? And then a the person says, how I handled it and, or how I failed, how it's difficult. And then I guide them. Now it's very listen. It's very important. You listen to this and write this down. To guide them. Not just to commend them. To guide them. To ask them, how have you been doing it? How did you handle it? And did you find it helpful? Did you find it difficult? This is very important because if you try to teach people, teach down, look, you know, speak down to them, very soon people would dislike you. Nobody likes to listen to you. They run away from you. They don't want to listen to you. But if you, you know, just listen to them and say, oh, it's difficult. I know it's very hard for you. And does it affect your sleep? So it's caring for them. Does it affect your sleep? Does it affect your your daily life and how do you feel now? And then the person says, yes, it's very difficult. And then you can guide them. And what have you tried to do to overcome the problem? And the person might say, I've tried this and tried that, but does it work? And he says, no, it doesn't work. Uh, or still, I'm still worried. And then, uh, can I suggest something to you? Now that is the best way. Can I suggest something to you? Say, say can, can I, I suggest something? something to you? Can I, can I share with you my way? Can I share with you my way? Then they feel you are a friend talking to them. And then you can share. And then after you share, you ask this question. Do you think you can apply it? Say it. Do you think you can apply it? Why do I ask? Because I might say a few concepts like the five steps to victory. After the person hears it, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. It's too hard. I don't understand. I don't know how to apply it. So we want to ask. And maybe a person says, I don't quite understand. Or I don't know how to apply it. When my husband yells at me, how can I do it? And then, and then we'll go through this again and, and help them go through this again. So this way is guiding, leading them, and listening to them, and, and uh, make sure that they understand. And then you can pray for them. And if you start to do this, your spiritual life will go down, go up, I'm sorry, will go up, and you'll be able to bless people. And then you will begin to have a strong heart to help people, help people. And, and if you also experience the Holy Spirit and then pray for people, you'll find people's life change and experience the Holy Spirit. Do you think, are you willing to do this? <coughs> yes. Do you find it hard? Now you, you can start with the friends you know. <coughs> you can ask them. Now first ask them in a church, before church or after church. And, but don't, every time don't start with, oh, like probing their problems. Then they also know that every time you want to find out my problems. Uh, you talk about daily life things too. You know, how are you doing? You know, uh, how's my, and then you talk about how you are doing and just chatting. Don't make people feel that every time you talk to them, you're counseling. <laughs> are you willing to try to do that? Yes. And have you, have, do you know people here in the church that are suffering in some way? That they have certain problems. Do you know people like that? Can you try to reach out to them? That's how you, you help them. How many people are willing to try to do this? Think about it. You really try. Okay. It can change the atmosphere of the church. Because the Bible says that one day we all have to stand in front of God. In Matthew 25, the three parables about the judgment, the last days. You notice that all the judgment about, all the passage about the judgment is never like this. Do you believe in Jesus? The person says, yes, I believe in Jesus. Okay, now you can have eternal life. It's not like that. In Matthew 25, do you remember the three parables? The first one is the parable of the ten virgins. Five wise ones, five foolish ones. 
So are you prepared? Do you have the oil? So this is preparation to have the life, the spiritual life, the relationship with God. And then the next parable is the parable about the talents. One servant has five talents, one has two, one has one, and then the master came back and asked them, what have you done with the talents? <coughs> and the one with the five talents said, what? I have earned five more. And the master said, you are a good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. And that verse really struck me. Faithful in a few things. Why a few things? I guess it's because a whole day, you know, a whole day, the time of the day, maybe only part of the time we think about God or we'll be doing something to, to glorify God. And that's why most of the time we might not be thinking about God or, or serving God. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone has to be a minister. But when you are working, if you are always thinking about God and, and praising God and loving God, then your heart is filled with the joy of the Lord. And then you would, the joy of the Lord will show, the life of God will show. That's why that verse motivated me to be filled with the joy of the Lord all the time, to pray to God all the time so that I'm filled with the thought of God, so that I'll be blessing people as much as possible. I'll be thinking about God as much as possible and to try to do more. And I hope that one day God will say to me, you have been faithful in more things than in the past. You have been faithful, still a few things, but more than before. I hope Jesus will also say the same to you, that you have been faithful in more things. But there is one with one talent with one talent and this one has buried the one talent and then the master you know said to him that you could have lent it to the to the banker and then you can earn interest but you did not so that could mean offering that you can help people help the missionary and but you did not so your money is wasted and then this servant is cast out into the darkness and then the uh, the third parable is about the, the sheep and the goats. The sheep are the ones who uh, have done these little things to one of the little ones of Jesus. And then Jesus said, you have done it to me. And they said, when did I do it to you? And she said, you did it to one of my little ones you have done to me. And then the goats are the ones who have not done this to the little ones. And then they are cast out into eternal punishment. So these parables tell us that we are saved by grace, but our actions prove our faith. Say it together. Our action proves our faith. If we say we believe in Jesus, but our action doesn't show it, that means the faith could be dead. So you notice that all the judgment passage, there is no passage that says, did you believe in Jesus? And the person says, yes, I believe in Jesus. Then come in and enjoy the eternal life. Have you heard of this evangelism method? They actually use that. When you, one day when you stand in front in the heaven, and then they'll ask you, why should I enter? <coughs> because I believe in Jesus. Now that's true, we believe in Jesus. But also, how do you show that, that you believe in Jesus? It's by the action. So all the judgment passage, no passage is just asking you whether you believe in Jesus. It's asking, have you done it? What have you done with the talents? What have you done to the little ones? Okay, now when you hear this, now I'm trying to disciple you now, encourage you now. You can do the same when you encourage other people. When you're sharing or teaching, now this would be more teaching them when you do this. Or you can have Bible study with people. Now when you look at this passage, one day we'll stand in front of God. And how do you think you will be? And how? And you can share about yourself too, you know. I, I, I didn't think about that. I just think, I go to church and I believe in Jesus, then I will, I will be admitted to heaven. When I read this passage, I realized that faith has to have fruits, has to bear fruit. If it doesn't bear fruit, it means faith without works is dead. Now let me ask you this question. When you hear this, if you were to die today, what do you have to give to Jesus? Your talents, has it been buried? 
Or are your talents used to glorify God? What are your answers to that? If you were to see Jesus today, <coughs> would your answer be, Oh, I didn't know you come back so soon. So I'm not ready. I'm sorry. I did not do anything. I thought I thought I have many years to prepare myself and one day I will serve you. I didn't know it's today. Today uh, I'm not ready yet. So when you hear this, would your heart say, Yes, I really want to start thinking. This week I want to go to church early and leave church later and talk to people and help them. And ask them, is there anything that I can pray for you? When you ask this question, you'll notice many people will say, Yes, I need your prayer. I need this help. I have this problem. And you'll be helping people. And Jesus will say one day, You have helped my little. You have helped me. And Jesus said, And you say, When did I help you? When you helped the little ones in the church. And when you start doing that, and then when you go out, then you have the confidence. Then you have the the experience, how to help more people, okay? Now I'd like to hear your responses. I See, you need to learn to speak before you will speak to other people. If you cannot speak now, you will not be able to speak to other people. So I ask you now, when you hear this, what would your response be? You can just say a sentence. One sentence, your immediate response. Now some people's response may be, well, I'm, I'm still, I still have too many problems, I cannot do anything. I'm too weak. I have many sins, I, I cannot do it. I'm not confident enough to do it. Uh, some of you may say, yes, I'm, it touches my heart. I want to do something for God. So what would be your responses? Can some people at least try to say something? Now, I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. I don't, I don't fear silence. I don't fear silence because I know it's your responsibility. Pardon me? Uh, what did you say? Uh, you were, were you saying something? Oh, amen. Okay. <laughs> okay, yes, please. Okay. Uh, can we just repeat your question again, Pastor? I, I just want to know, like, you mean like uh, your question was your question was what can I give uh, Jesus? Maybe if I have, I have to see him. Was that your question? Uh, no. Huh? My question is: Yes. When you know that one day when you stand in front of God, yes, it will be like the parables of the talents and the parable of the sheep and goat. Mm -hmm. And then when you hear that one day you have to give an account. It could be today. It could be some other day. When you hear this, how is your response? When you hear that you have to give an account of your life, mm -hmm. how would you respond to that teaching in the Bible? Yes, I would walk in salvation with fear. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Okay. You know, if I hear that, uh, I will have to now stand up and you know, start evangelism mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Again, to show love, mm -hmm. uh, the love that God gave me, mm -hmm. uh, I have to share to this man, mm -hmm. uh, tell them how I came to be a child of God. Okay. Uh, like you were saying uh, about, you were asking us uh, how many people do you need in the church. Uh, you find out that uh, the reason why we don't know people is because, like you said, uh, we only interact with friends. Uh, sometimes when uh, there are new people who are coming in the house of God, and they come with problems, mm -hmm. uh, with challenges, some they want to be loved, but they come to the house of God and they find that these guys they only associate with themselves. They will go. Uh, so now we have lost the soul. Mm -hmm. And maybe you are the only person who could have helped that person. And tomorrow you have to give an account. Didn't you see that person who came there? I, I saw that person and what did you do? I, I did nothing. So uh, I really have to be accountable for my actions uh, in, in tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Now, thank you very much. I want to ask you this question. You said I will start to do evangelism. Have you done it? 
I did it before then I, I stopped. But then I have to study again. Okay. Yes. And how? The main thing is how will you start to do it again? Uh, I will have to go out. Mostly my work is out there to the lost souls. I know here, yes, I can learn about my friends' challenges, pray together. But out there, there are some people who really need God. They have not yet been reached, so they need the love. Yeah, but how will you start to do it? My question is how? How? What way? Where do you get the people? Where do you go to the people? Mm -hmm. Outside, those who are going to be like. In the yeah, no. Yes. Like you go to the park, you go to the neighborhood, you go to the shop. See, I want to ask specific. Because when sometimes people say, yes, I want to do it, and then when like we don't think to, about I used to do it like this. I used to go house by house. Oh, so you go house to house. Yes. That's very good. That's very good. So that's, you have a specific method. Yes. That's very good. Okay? Now, basically I want you to give a one or two sentence response. Uh, other people, just one or two sentence response to what I just said. What you want to start to do. Yes? Yeah, I tried to implement it many times. You know, I've got all the rules and I talk to people and you know. And if most, of, most, most of the time when you talk to them, they receive you a good excitement. You know, you know, we find that it is very difficult for us to approach the people. But the moment you start, you know, the moment you start, you feel that you know that joy and people they will just you know they will just receive you. They don't they don't speak anything negative to you when you are in the center. So as soon as you just introduce yourself and then after you talk about Jesus, you know, they want to know more, they listen to you. So but that evangelism is not something that we need to We need to just try it. You know, wherever we go, wherever you go, whether in, 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 the, in the bus or at work, you know, you can just do it. The moment you get used to it, it is just an easy thing. Okay. Now you're sharing that in the past you found that when you just you, you were afraid before you started, but when you started, then you find it easier. Now it's yeah, not. It's yeah. best because you know I will be postponed. <coughs> Today I'm going. When I think of it, I feel, you know, this, that, that is here. That is here. I'll stop. I'll say I'll go tomorrow. I'll go next week. I'll keep on, you know, postponing. But at last, you know, I, you know, I got the courage. Okay. Mm. So I hope you would start doing it. <coughs> what happened the first night when you hear when I talk about the experience God evangelism? That first you practice praying for people, so you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's something you need to continue to do. That you get used to praying for people. And you can also feel the move of the Holy Spirit. That when I pray for people, I always <coughs> pay attention to the flow of the Holy Spirit. So my hand is very light on the person. And see how the person moves, sway. Very often when people experience the Holy Spirit, they will sway. And I notice that. And then I know how much the person experienced. And then I encourage them to open the heart more. And then after the prayer, then I ask them, do you remember the question? Please keep your eyes closed if you experience anything during the prayer. And then if they say, yes, uh, I've experienced peace or comfort, and then we'll tell them from the Bible that Jesus said, peace I give to you. Or he will make our body rest and secure. Uh, and also, uh, you heal the brokenhearted. The, the love of God is poured into our heart. It's either peace, love, joy, comfort, or uh, inner healing, or physical healing. And then we'll say, God has blessed you. Do you want Jesus to continue to bless you? And then if the person is willing, then we explain the gospel and lead them to Christ. How many of you were there on that day when I talked about that? That experience God evangelism. That's something I want you to try to do. It's very effective. Because in the past when I do evangelism, I just talk to people about eternal life and heaven. And some people, they're not interested. But when I listen to them and they have certain problems, and then I say, God can help you where you are. Or even on the street, sometimes I say, we can experience God. God is very real. He can help us in different problems. And some people will be curious, how can we experience God? 
I've done it on the street. I also made tracks like this. I designed my own tracks that uh, something like Jesus can bring healing to the body. Jesus can bring comfort to the sorrow. Jesus can help the uh, uh, help sleeping problems. So things like that that people see it and they're curious. And then I will talk about Jesus, how powerful he is. But for, with this method of evangelism, you have to practice praying for people and, and pray more to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Have you tried, anyone tried? Has anyone here tried to use this method? Now we went to the school. I prayed for hundreds of students. And many of them said that they experienced God. Many of them. And so it's something that works. And, and we also practice here and then pray for each other. And then and they find that they do experience the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, there are some people in the church here who might not be saved. Don't think that you have to go outside first. You go inside first because there are people who go to church and they hear a message. Sometimes they don't get the message. Or when they heard the message, they did not know for sure they're saved. People will answer you, Oh, when I do good, I'll be safe. When I pray, I'll be safe. Instead of answering you, we are saved when we trust in Jesus as our Savior and we confess our sins. And then so we are saved by grace through faith. And then after we're saved, then we have a good relationship with God and repent and obey God. And those are the fruit of salvation. So you try to help each person here to be strong in the faith. And it will be a good way, uh, maybe this is a good way, Apostle, to arrange people in the neighborhood. Like you live in a certain area and you have certain members in that church and you will follow up on those people because then it's easier to visit those people. So it can be arranged, then it will be, uh, then some people in that area can try to help the other members but first you know each other in the church and then you ask them uh, do you like me to visit you and talk with you and pray for you and then you find that people will open up sometimes when they know that you, you care and then they talk about how they have difficulties and then you listen to them and pray for them but you might say I have similar problems how can I help them <laughs> you might say I have similar job problem or a husband or a marriage problem or similar problems now how you are trying to cope with the problems, you can share. You don't have to be totally vic victorious. That you have tried to overcome the problem and you are making progress, then you can share with people. Now if, if you say, might say, well I, I failed totally in all these problems. I have total failure. You can still help people and say, I have the same problem as you, let's pray together and find a solution. <laughs> okay, now let me ask you this. When you hear this just now, then you can do this. Are you willing to try? Are you willing to try? To, this week, when you come to church, you talk to someone and care about them and pray for them. And maybe just make friends with them. Not just with your friends. You might already have five friends in your church. You always sit with them and talk with them. Try to go to other people. Are you willing to do that? And that's how you start to change. And that's how I change. And also, of course, I, you know, as a pastor, I talk to many people. I make a point with, with many people. But now it's the reverse. Because I'm not a, a church pastor anymore. I, I'm a... I, I have a training program, ministry training program. And people call me up and say, can you pray for me? Can you, do, uh, can you counsel me? Can you help me? People have the needs because they heard that I've helped many people. So people approach me and I have too many people that need help. And you can try to do that. And one area of practice, let me tell you, is behind you, the principal, Rachel. Today and yesterday, God gave me the heart when I went to the school. When I saw so many children there, my heart is greatly touched. I feel compassion for the children. 
I know that many of them are not sure about salvation. And then I talked I, I, I talk to Rachel that you can have an influence on these children and you can, you know, have a church, children's church, and then build up evangelism to them, and then the teachers participate, and, and then uh, affect the society. Because in this society, so many people are single mothers. But teach the children from childhood that, that we should be responsible. That uh, when they are older, when we talk about, you know, uh, uh, relationship with people, then we talk about that we should only uh, marry Christians and no sex before marriage. So teachings like that to affect the, uh, the children so that one day a group of healthy children, Christian children will come out from the church. And this is a good place to practice. So if you want to practice, because helping children is very easy. You go there. It's very easy. So you can talk with Rachel and say, I, I want to try them. Because there you get the courage. And then after you try there, you have the courage to go anywhere. I tell you, I have the courage to go to anybody. So if you are interested, do you know, all, know Rachel? <laughs> so if you are interested, that is a good practice ground for you. And the church is a good practice ground for you. Now when you hear this, you know, this message can change how you will look when you come to the judgment seat one day. I know a person, a woman in China, who waited for the Lord three hours every morning, 4 a.m. until 7 a.m. And then after she waited for the Lord for a period of time, Jesus started to take her to heaven and to different places. And one time she saw a Christian who died. This Christian helped her mother. The, the name of the woman is called Reina. Her mother is also a minister. And then there was a couple who helped her mother. But the husband, before he died, uh, he, he got sick. And then he doubted about God. And then he said, I served God and God did not help me and I got sick and I'm going to die. I, and then he did not pray. That's what his wife said. That he did not pray for three months before he died. And then Raina went to heaven and saw that place. A big hall like a judgment hall. And there was a scale. A scale. And one side is the grace of God. And the other side is what we have done. After we, we are saved. And when that man stand in front of the scale... The grace of God was very heavy and what he has done for the Lord is very light because he has a problem actually with his faith that he doubted God. And the angel said, according to what you do, you cannot live here. And he was very afraid. But then the Lord said, by my grace, you can live here. It was by God's grace. Now let me ask you, if you have to stand in front of God today, would God say, you are just barely saved? <laughs> or you, your action doesn't show your faith? Or God will say, you have helped many people. You have brought many people to Christ. You have witnessed to many people. You have used your life to the maximum. And when God is pleased with you, the Bible says, when you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, your life will blossom and you'll be full of blessings. You know, actually all these teachings in the Bible, it talks about how we have to stand in front of God and also uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talk about one day all our works will be tested. We all build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And some of us will be building with gold, silver and precious stone that stays forever. But some of us will be building with wood, hay, and straw. And then it will be burned. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 said that some people are barely saved. But according to Matthew 25, there are people who actually are not saved. That the one with the five talents has buried the talents and he's not saved. 
is cast out into darkness. And then the sheep who has not done anything to the children of God, they are not saved either. We are not saved by good works, we are saved by grace through faith. But when we are saved, we will have action. And the more you serve God, then you are really loved by God. He is pleased with you. Because, you know, as, uh, as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is in His love toward those who fear Him. When you fear God, His love for you, actually His love is for everyone. But when you fear God, then the love will be able to come into your heart. You can experience His love. Okay? So when I talk about all this, are you willing to start to talk to people? You know, the experience starts by you trying to do it. And then it will grow gradually. And then you have more experience. After a while, you don't want to stop. For me, I don't want to stop. And if you have a chance to go to the school, because the children are more simple, minded, and you pray for them, and they experience the Holy Spirit, that's a good practice ground for anointing. <laughs> because they're very simple minded, they're happy that you pray for them. And then you see that how you can help them to experience the Holy Spirit more. And then when you pray for people, then you have the experience. Can some of you respond with one or two sentences? When you hear this, what do you want to do? Anyone want to respond? I hope you have the courage. I need to show the love of the Christ the most. Mm -hmm. First I greet the next person, the person next to me. The way I want to see my neighbor is the next person, the person next to me. The person I sit next to will call me or will tell me the person next to me. And then it becomes easier with me. Amen. Yes. And you can also start with the worship team too. Even though they are in worship team, some of them might be burdened. And might be weak. So you can help them spiritually to be strong. Start with the people around you. It's not so hard. And now, what, what can you do? Okay, if someone is willing, what can you do? <coughs> Let's write down a few things you can do. Start with our families first. Pardon me? Start with our own families. families. Families, okay. That's one area. Um, now, families will be caring about the person. That's easy to start with that because that is caring for the person. Uh, we can start with the family, but eventually, actually, we want to go to one important point. What is it? You, you can write down, we can go to family, emotional life, how are you doing, how's your... Um, for instance, one question is, do you find help in prayer? Because some people, they pray and they don't, don't find any help, they don't find strength. So first you need to find strength. That every time you pray, do you find strength? How many people here, every time you pray, you find strength? Can you raise your hand? If every time you pray, you can experience help, would you raise your hand high up? Okay, so some of you have experienced strength. Now, if you have not been able to get strength when you pray, then you, you know, you examine whether you have humility, repentance, and faith in God is here, and then you experience the Holy Spirit, how to keep the anointing. You know, I talk about the anointing. When the anointing is on you, when you pray, you can feel the presence of God. You can feel the peace or the, or the love or the joy of the Lord. So you find strength in the relationship. And so the relationship with God, that uh, salvation, are you sure about salvation? You can ask the person uh, at one point. Don't start with that. If you start with that, they, they think that you are trying to examine my faith. You ask like how is their family life and or uh, do you find strength when you pray do you have uh, uh, strength uh, from jesus or do you find it very difficult you know so you help the prayer life and then you can come to do you think that you know that you have have a living relationship with god this is another way to say are you safe do you have a living relationship with god and and if the person have 
uh, feel that he can trust you, then he will tell you different things. The main thing is, you look at a person and see if he's comfortable. If you find that the person is not comfortable, don't go any further. If you go any further, next time he will reject you. This is very important, write this down. Like for adults, you approach them and you try to care for them, but he feel pressure. Then what happens is, the next time he sees you coming, he, he thinks you're going to preach to him again. He, will, he doesn't want you anymore. So when you see that person is reluctant, then you slow down. Uh, it's best to just to ask them uh, the needs, you know, to, to enter from the need. It's, it's very important. What are their needs? You know? But you don't ask like this. You, know, you can ask, how is your family? How is your work? How's your work? Um, how are you doing? Do you find uh, strength when you pray? And um, do you understand the sermons? Do you find help in the sermons? Um, now, when you ask this, when a person says, no, I don't find help, then you say, okay, what is difficult for you? You find out how it's difficult. Maybe he, it's hard to listen. Maybe he cannot remember. So find ways how to help the person. And then you want to come to helping the salvation and also helping the relationship. Does he have strength in the relationship, the spiritual life? Now, let me tell you a few things that <coughs> a healthy Christian will always have. So these are things that you can, you can find out about the person. First, you want to write down, we are saved by grace through faith. So when you talk with somebody, you want to make sure that the person is safe. That how are we safe? We're not safe by doing good. We're not safe by praying enough. We're safe by faith. When we have repentance and trust in Jesus as our Savior, then we are safe. But then when we are saved, then we have this Fruits. Is there a paper? Okay. Okay, now. Now the passage. How to be saved? Repentance. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, if God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and from all unrighteousness. And then faith would be John 3.16, for God so loved the world, and whoever believes in Him that will have eternal life. And also, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, if not for the Holy Spirit, no one can confess that Jesus is Lord. So when someone confesses that Jesus is Lord, that means he has eternal life. So there's someone who really confessed Jesus' life, has faith in him. Okay, now, when people are saved, they would have these fruits, these signs. The first one is continual repentance. Continual repentance. If a person says he's saved, but he does not repent of his sins and continue to sin, there is something wrong. In Galatians 5, 19-20, one, you can write this down and look at it at home. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, it says that when people do these works of the flesh, like adultery, fornication, hatred, jealousy, you know, many people have hatred or jealousy, envy, drunkenness, and people who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There will be people are in sins and are not repentant, they do not have eternal life. Now, then you say, well, how many Christians have eternal life? All Christians have sins. The point is, we are repentant and we try to overcome the sins. If people are not repentant and they don't change, that means they have no feeling about sins. Then they're not saved. All Christians have sinned. 
but we are repentant and then we try to change. And when I talk about how to overcome sin, remember the five steps to victory. Aware. Destructive. It is destructive. Sins are destructive. Number three. Apply biblical principle. Number four, pray. And number five, choose to obey. That when we have sinful thoughts, we know it's destructive. Immediately we take care of that. That is a key to uh, victory over sins. We can have victory over sins. When the sinful thoughts, when you don't like somebody, immediately you take care of that. And immediately you can have victory. When you choose to obey and say, my life is precious. I don't want to hinder by this person because it's his problem that he has sinned against me. I, I don't want to be affected by him. And then you choose not to be affected. So the uh, continue repentance. And then number two is continue faith. Continue trust or dependent. Now, I, I like to use the word trust, dependent, rather than just believe. Because some people think belief is like, do you believe there is a Britain, a Great Britain? Do you believe there is a Great Britain? We all believe that. But does it affect your daily life? No. I mean, many people think of believing in Jesus like this. Yes, I believe in Jesus. There is a Jesus in heaven. So when people think of Jesus, they think, yes, I believe, but we trust in Jesus. That means we rely on Him and depend on Him. So I use these two words, trust and depend. Do you trust in Jesus and depend on Him? So that, that we depend on Him. And John 1, 12, that we receive Him, as many as who receive Him, that in Him, that all those who receive Him, He give the right to become children of God. You know, when we believe in Jesus, that means we receive Him. Let Him be the Lord. Okay, number three, signs of salvation. Have a close relationship with God. Close relationship with God. John 15, verse 5 to 6. That I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And then if anyone does not abide me in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Many Christians just pray on Sundays. They don't pray daily. Or some people Christians pray for three minutes a day. Now the, they, if they pray for three minutes a day, it depends on the prayer. Some prayer are like this. Oh Jesus, heal my body. Oh, help my family members. Oh Jesus, find me a job. Oh Jesus, help me to sleep better. Let me ask you, if people just pray like this, are they saved for sure? If someone just prayed like this, the prayer for salvation must include confession of sins and ask for forgiveness and ask for salvation. It's not just praying for health and strength and the job. But some people just pray for a job and, and help. You know, that is not the prayer of salvation. So have a close relationship with God, abides in Jesus. And also this relationship includes a dialogue with God. God will talk to you. When we are saved, God will talk to you. God will tell us when we sin. So this is something we can help people. When we sin, do you hear God's voice telling you it's not right? Do you feel uncomfortable? Now when people say that, you can also say, that shows that you have a living relationship with God. When people feel sorry for their sins, now then do you repent and trust in Jesus to forgive you and change. Now these are the signs. First they are sensitive to their sins and then they are sorry for their sins and they want to trust in Jesus for salvation, for forgiveness. These are the signs of salvation. If the person has this continual dialogue, that God continue to talk to them. Do you have this continual dialogue with God? And let me tell you, the closer you are to God, the more the dialogue will be. And God will talk to you about little sins, very little sins. You will notice that very little things you did to someone, God will talk to you about it. Okay. 
okay? So the continual relationship, prayer, and also reading the Bible and responding to the Bible, applying the Bible. Some people hear the Bible, but they don't apply it. They hear a sermon, and they don't apply it. Okay, number four, love God. 1 Corinthians 16.22 1 Corinthians 16.22 If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Wow, this is very heavy. That means in the relationship with God, there must be love. Because this is the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. This is Mark 12, 30. That this is the greatest commandment, to love God. Because He's so good to us. That we want to like God. We want to do something to please God. They want to have the relationship with God. That is love. It's like you love your parents. You love your friend. You love your spouse. Then you love God. So if a person just wants something from God and doesn't love God, there's something wrong with the faith. I'm not saying he's not saved, but some people have very little love. Very little. Then he's just barely saved. It's like salvation is like a ship. And he's just holding onto the edge of the ship. And he might be sinking anytime. But we want to be in the ship. And we won't be saving people from the ocean. Okay, and then number five, obey God. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. Who are the people who say, Lord, Lord? These are people who have been to church and learned to pray. They say, Lord, Lord. They learn to pray. Not every one of these will have eternal life, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many miracles in your names? And then I will say to them, declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You will say, how come these people do not obey God? They have done these things. Let me tell you, it's like this. There are people in the church, they are happy to help with refreshment, sweeping the floor, even praise and worship. But they don't take care of their own sins. They don't obey God in the relationship with God. They do things that are superficial. And it looks like they are serving God. But in their inner life, they let sins control them. They let anger control them. They let frustration control them and affect the family and their life. Then they are not obeying Jesus. They are just doing the superficial things. I heard someone says, a preacher retired and did not go to church anymore. And someone said, why didn't you go to church now? He said, I've been to church many years. Now I'm retired. Don't go anymore. <laughs> that means he just go there as a job. <laughs> okay, number six, bear fruit. And there are two kinds of fruit. The fruit of life, fruit of the of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. That love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. This fruit of life. That the life show manifestation. That people can see Jesus' life. And the second is the fruit of ministry or blessing other people. Like John 15, 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit so it's helping people bringing people to Jesus helping people to follow Jesus so these are discipleship passages and also what I said to you earlier that we have to stand in front of God to be judged actually you will find many passages when you see passages you can you can mark it with letters like you can use D for discipleship so this is a Bible verse that encourages people to love God more. So you put a D there. And then passages for evangelism, you put an E there. Uh, passages for healing, uh, uh, inner healing. It's up to you, you can put an I, inner healing. 
And then so you look up the passage and then you can see. You should mark the Bible. If you don't mark the Bible, when you look up the look at the Bible, it's all blank. It's very hard to find a passage that you like. And also you can put a keyword there. Uh, if your Bible allows it, that I mean there is enough space for it, then you can put a, a keyword there. So these are passages that you should remember. And we should all remember what Christians should do. Okay, so I just uh, respond to you how to help someone spiritually. Now this is the basics, the basis. But then you want to raise some people. You can do more things for God. Then you use passage like uh, Psalm 139, 16 to 18. Psalm 139, 16 to 18. Where it talks about that God has a wonderful plan in your life. That all the days of your life has been written in the book. And also uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2. That there is a good, uh, perfect and pleasing will of God. That if you dedicate, offer your body as a living sacrifice and also do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the uh, transformation of the renewal of the mind, then you will follow this perfect plan of God. So this is raising up people to serve God. I always do that. When I see people who have potential, who wants to serve God and bless other people, then I will lead them and say, do this, try to do this, and tell me what happens. Now this is very important. Then you have this person as a disciple. What do you do? You talk to this person, this person is happy that you help him. And you help him to pray how to have strength, and the person has strength. And you notice that this person now respond to God and say, yes, I want to have a closer relationship with God. I want to help people. And then you say, let us go and help someone. Let's go help someone together. And you find that that person has potential. And then you tell them, you can find the perfect will of God. And you can go higher and higher. You can be used by God. And I raise up people like that. I talked to Rachel today, these two days. I want to raise her up to be the minister of the church in the school. The children's church. That she can be used by God like that. That, that I asked her, can she do this preaching, counseling, and uh, discipleship, and, and, and different things. And then, and then she said, this I'm not more confident, this I need to learn. And, then, and I said, I, I'm willing to help you more. So when I see people like that, and I say, can you experience the Holy Spirit? Can you pray for people? Do you experience the Holy Spirit? Do you want to have confidence to pray for people to raise up the spiritual life and to uh, lead people to Christ? So when I see people, I will look at them and see if they have potential, if they are willing. Now first I want to ask you now, are you willing yes. to move forward? Let me tell you, it is not all easy. Helping people is not all easy. There is always rejection. There are always lazy Christians. <coughs> but it doesn't matter. You keep helping. There will be always people who respond to you. Now I want to tell you one concept. In a church there is a pyramid. What I mean is, the different kinds of people in a church. In the lowest level, you can write this down. There are Christians who always concentrate <coughs> on their needs. In the lowest level, there are Christians who always concentrate in their needs. They always say, oh, I have family problems, I have this problem, that problem. Oh, I never get, get over the problems. They just concentrate in the problems. They always want to find help, but they never can get over the problems. And then the next level are, are people who are more steady in a faith with God, more steady. And then the next level up are people who start to serve God. And the next level up are people who are dedicated to serve God. But there is still a higher level. That people have found the strategy of God. Now this level, there are different levels. There are some people who find very high plan of God. Like this woman I told you about in China, Reina. That she actually went to places and she would know the needs of the people. Because when she led meetings, very often God would wake her up in the middle of the night. Sometimes at 1 p.m. And then would, she would have a time to wait for the Lord and the Lord would speak to her. 
and tell her the needs of the people. And the next day, she would apply to the people. Like for instance, one time, she ministered to a group of people and God told them, their problem is that they have murdered people. They have done abortion. You have to bring this up and you have to bring up these sins. And then in a meeting, she brought it up and she brought up the different sins. The people were in repentance, but finally she said, this sins of abortion, that you have murdered people. And then when she said that, many people broke out in tears and cry and wail because they have done abortion many times. God spoke to her to guide her in the, the highest plan of God, that she knew the need of the people. Now, these people who have the close relationship with the Lord, that, that God will speak to them. And there are different levels. Like God spoke to me about Rachel's school. When I was there, the thought just came to me. Quickly. Some people might be in the school for a long time and did not have the feeling. But when I went there, immediately I got the feeling. But some people get a clearer picture. So this is the highest level. But first, are you at the level of always needing have needs? The needing. And the next level are people who are steady, but yet are not contributing much. And the next level are people who start to serve. And the next level are people who really dedicate to serving. Now, let me ask you, these people who are really dedicated to serving, service and compared to those who are following the highest strategy of God, finding the strategy of God, are there much difference in the effort? Sometimes not much. <clears throat> the time spent of some people, they spend a lot of time in church. They're doing a lot of things in church. They're very busy. But they're not finding the highest strategy. And the difference is very big difference. Let me tell you, one person who found the strategy of God and really follow that strategy. He can be more powerful than thousands or tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of people. When I go to places, I affect people as a group. I change people as a group. I raise some people as a group. And if I, you, you think of it, every time I go to a different place, people are changed. How many people can I affect? But some people, they can only affect one or two persons. Some people cannot even affect one person. But some people affect thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people. Is that a big, big difference? It's a big, big difference. So some people can be very busy doing a lot of things, like a soldier on the ground. They, they're very busy doing things, but one pilot using one bomb can do much in a, in a battle. So we too, one person who found the strategy of God. How do you find the strategy of God? When you have a close relationship with God, and God will tell you what to do. And gradually you have the heart to love people, care about people. It starts with one individual. It doesn't start with large meetings. I have brought revival to some people, and then one person said, one day I want to hold big meetings. I tell them, First start with the individuals around you. You have to learn to help individuals and then you can help a large group. And also you, it's very important for us to evaluate. There is a pie, you can write this down. P, I, E. P is praying and planning. Praying and planning. So you pray about it and you plan what to do. You pray about something, pray or plan, so P. I is implement, so you put it in action. E is evaluation, so you evaluate what you're doing, and then you go back to pray and plan, and then go to implement, and then evaluate. So you keep evaluating yourself, how can I do better? Let me tell you, every time I go to a new place, I always talk to the pastor. I want the pastor to be changed. The pastor is my target because if the pastor change and I ask the pastor, can you apply this in your church? Do you want to? 
What are the needs in your church? How can I help you? My strategy is to help the pastor that he can apply. Because if I help some individuals and they don't follow it, then it's not going to change the church. But if the pastor wants to follow it and then lead the people, and then the group of people can go forward. Can go forward. So a pastor leading people to go forward to serve God, then that pastor is doing his job. But the pastor just do the job and attract people, but he doesn't raise up people. Then the other people are not doing the job. Then he's not really doing his job because the uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 13 talks about the job of pastors or apostles that the Lord himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and be of the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man, to the measure of the statue, stature of the fullness of Christ. So the pastors are to build up people to serve God. If in his church, everyone just come to listen. He's not doing his job. He wants to raise up people so everyone serves God. And then the power will be very powerful. Mm -hmm. The church will be growing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you hear me talk about the strategy and what kind, what level of Christians. When you hear this, you want to respond. You can respond by one or two sentences. You want to respond. You want to go a higher level. Do you want to use your life? You can only live once. You only live once. That's why I really push myself to the maximum, but in a very relaxed way. I serve God in a very relaxed way because God's way is that Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He doesn't want people to be burdened. He wants us to be carrying the burden very lightly because His yoke is easy. The Lord is with us and that is easy. But when you carry the burden yourself, it's very heavy. Now, when you hear this, you want to respond. It's very important that you respond. Here, I, basically, I talk about discipleship, how to raise up people. And the first people to be raised up are you. Are you willing to start? If you are not willing to start, you just come for a meeting to hear some sermon and get encouraged and feel good and not do anything, then it's not going to change your life. Does anyone want to respond? This is, I'm, I'm trying your courage now. I'm testing your courage. Does anyone want to respond? Anyone? One or two sentences. It challenges me to have a hundred thoughts or according to my capacity. The Bible says that we have all given. Understand? So in my giving, I want to in that which I have been given, I want to give my like all, have more fruits. As the Bible says, I'm a hundred, four, I'm a sixty, I'm a thirty. If I am a hundred, let me give my hundred, embracing my people. Yes, amen, hallelujah. The more you do it, the more, more confident you are. Let me tell you, now sometimes people see me with different kinds of problems. All kinds of problems, including financial problems. I'm not an expert in finance, but I can still give people suggestions with the help of God and also help them with their life. That many people come to me for marriage problems or prayer problems, problems with weakness of their spiritual life. Okay, anyone else want to respond? I want to test your courage. Are you willing to say, yes, I want to try? Or you say, I'm just a small potato. Whether I say anything or not, doesn't matter. It's not going to make a difference. <laughs> Let me tell you, all the people around you is their business. Your, your response is your business. One day when you come to God, you cannot say, oh, my pastor is following you. He's faithful. All the people around me are faithful. God will ask you, have you been faithful? So the person most important is you.
When you hear, do you, do you say, yes, I'm Lord. Lord, I want to start. I want to start. Or people say, you know, doing all these things, many people have fear. Evangelism, there's fear. Let me tell you, I have, I have fear too. But I will overcome it. And I keep praying and God will help me. God will guide me. And sometimes I find ways. Let me tell you how I found ways. Even on the plane, let me tell you. One time, you know, usually when I get on a plane, the person next to me, or any situation, when I come across a situation, I try to relate to the person and talk to the person. And one time when I got on a plane, the person just covered himself with a blanket. He slept all the way through. So I did not have a chance. But I kept praying to God. At the end, he pulled out his blankets. I was getting off the plane. I said, how are you? And then, you know, I talked to him a little bit, and then I say, I'm a pastor. And he's interested. He was interested. And he wanted to know more about God. He said, I've been asking that question. And you just are the right person to come to me. <laughs> and I want to know the answer. And then, and, then I, and then he sent me an email. I told him my email to ask for this help. And I sent it to him. So, God has helped me to relate to different people. When I came here, there was a businessman who has his concept. It's difficult to follow God totally. And I tried to help him. So the more people we help, the, the more efficient we will be. And also with the power of the Holy Spirit, it's very different. Now at this point, I know it's time already, but I want to very quickly pray for you again to experience the Holy Spirit very quickly. The main thing is for you to keep that. And also I want you to notice how people experience the Holy Spirit, that you might, that you might feel the swaying of the body. You might feel the peace of God, the comfort of the Lord. And it's very important that you're sensitive to the presence of God. That when you pray for people in the future, you know how they experience the Holy Spirit. Does any one person want to come forward? I'm testing your courage again. Does any one person want to come forward and just demonstrate? I want to demonstrate praying for people. Lord Jesus, help us with courage. Lord Jesus, help this group with courage. I thought Africans are very free people. I saw that on, you know, on videos or TV. So courageous. So free. One person, I want to demonstrate how. I'm demonstrating. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you, Kenneth. Okay, now relax. When I pray for people, first I open my heart to God. I love God. So that's something I have to build up. And I can feel the power of God. And when I'm at home, the more open I am, the more I feel the swing of or the peace of God, or the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> but when I'm praying for someone, I cannot let the joy flow out. That might scare me. So I just open my heart. And think of my spirit ascend to God. Or think of God's spirit as coming down to me. And then I'll ask for permission. Is it okay if I lay hand on you and pray for you? Okay, and then I lay hand and then I will. Continue to let the Spirit come into me. Hallelujah. And it's a very simple prayer to help the person. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now you can see the swing of the body. That usually when this happens, the people is beginning to experience the Holy Spirit. Although it's not universal, but this is a very common sign. So I uh, encourage the person, the Holy Spirit is upon you. Open your heart to more. Relax more. Think of God as descending, coming into your heart. Or crying out to God, oh, ah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Empower you. Lord Jesus, come upon him. Come upon him. Now, make sure that you're not putting pressure on the body 
and just lightly touching. Oh, hallelujah, oh, oh. and be very free and relax. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, do not have the pressure of whether he experienced the Holy Spirit or not. Just relax and do it. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Now, keep your eyes closed. I like to ask this is the way I do evangelism. Have you experienced anything during the prayer? Can you describe it? that he feels something come to his heart. That the Holy Spirit would come to his heart and he felt comfort to the heart. So in the process, you notice at the beginning he was not moving. But then I opened my heart more and more. So I usually, when I lay in, I just have my fingertips touching the person. So I'm not limiting the movement. But I'm prepared if he falls back. I'm prepared to hold him. And I don't want to push people. I've seen people push people like this, and they shoot. They would do this. And then when the head is back, they <laughs> I mean, pushing the head doesn't cause people to experience a pushing. It's how they experience inside that will change the people. And if they fall down, it's fine. If they don't, it's okay. When I prayed for Rachel, she fell down and went for that. She was healed. Her legs were healed. But it doesn't have to fall down every time, too. Okay? I'm going to do it very quickly. Pray for you. Oh, Jesus touching you. Jesus touching you. Hallelujah. The love of God coming to you. Man. Motivate him to send him. Oh Lord Jesus, it's going to send heaven. And provide for him and give him the provision so that he can do more things for God. But Jesus give him the courage. Yes, he can do it. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you experience more? Can you describe what just happened just now? I feel like sitting down because I know my legs are not strong enough. <laughs> <laughs> then he's feeling a stronger and stronger presence of God. How about in your heart? How do you feel now? My heart is calm, and then I feel like strength, like I'm losing strength of the body. Yes. It's then like John's in Revelation 117 that he could not stand. So that's how I do. I, I keep letting the Holy Spirit be poured into me. And a person will experience stronger and stronger.